Hello, students. Uh, I understand that this is a little strange way of uh, meeting you for the first time. Uh, you know, the pandemic is uh, raging. So, under the circumstances, uh, you know, this is the best we can do. But there are certain advantages, unlike a live lecture in a classroom, you will have access to this recording uh, anytime and every time you would like to uh, rewind it and uh, listen to it again. And I will be accessible over uh, email, informal Zoom meeting, formal Zoom meeting, or whatever you need to get clarification on the topic uh, anytime, okay? I will have like uh, three, four hours in a week dedicated uh, for interacting with you. So just by way of introduction, uh, my name is uh, Amitabha Vandapadde. I am a member of the BSB faculty, your department. Uh, in my laboratory, we study uh, developmental biology uh, and there I use a variety of uh, molecular biology and genetic techniques to study how cartilage and bone uh, develop, form, maintain uh, in these uh, organisms. As part of this course, which is called Cellular and Molecular Biology, the course number is BSc 651A. I'll teach you some of the basic aspects of molecular biology and cell biology. And uh, like, uh, I will try very hard to teach it in a manner so that if you learn the concepts well, you should be able to apply those in the laboratories. Even if you are not uh, in a laboratory that uses uh, CMB uh, regularly, but you, know, you might end up in a uh, CMB laboratory later, or you just might uh, uh, be able to apply these concepts in, uh, in some aspect of your research. And I can tell you that understanding the molecular biology and the genetics is fundamental to most aspects of biology that you can think of, uh, particularly today when interdisciplinary uh, work, research, thinking is the flavor of the day. I cannot see any genre of biology where you can uh, do well without understanding the basic tenets of uh, molecular and cell biology. Now, this can be taught in one of the two ways. One is that, you know, I can teach you the basic processes first, like uh, transcription, translation. Replication is not covered in this course. Um, transcription, translation, or other cell biological processes, intercellular trafficking, etc. first, and then talk about the techniques that are used to conduct such experiments. The other way of doing it is that I teach you the techniques first, and then get to these fundamental processes so that it becomes easier for me to convey to you how 
these fundamental processes, how we learned about these fundamental processes using the techniques that were taught to you first. So I do not think any one method is necessarily better than the other. It's just that I find this one a little bit more comfortable from my personal perspective. Therefore, I will start with molecular genetic techniques. I would like to emphasize that the purpose is not to give you a whole lot of information. Information in today's day and age is available on the internet. You ask Google any well-crafted question, you will get the answer that you need. My job, as I see it, is to enable you to train you so that you can make sense of the information, so that you can use that information to design your own experiments, so that instead of remembering what is transcription, what is translation, what is transcriptional regulation, etc., you can design experiments to investigate transcriptional regulation in your uh, chosen context, translational regulation in your chosen context, a cell biological phenomenon in your chosen context. That is the purpose. Okay? Therefore, I will be covering less number of topics, but I will get to the depth of the limited set of topics that I will be talking about. This is, of course, a graduate level course for MTechs and for PhDs. Many of you have done BTechs or MSCs in a biology related subject. So you may have studied some of these processes from the course content, it might appear to you that you already know all of this, but I would request that you pay attention to the lectures uh, because chances are that I'll be able to talk to you about things that you have not thought about before. Um, also, I want to impress upon you that though it is a graduate level course in a biology department, so you may think that if you are coming from a non-biology background, you will have certain disadvantage. I do not completely agree with it. I have taught graduated students from my own lab who came from very different background, like uh, as far as electronics engineering, they took these courses and uh, they did reasonably all right. The level of understanding that you require to understand this course is no more than class 12 level biology. Like you should know the chemical structure of DNA, RNA, protein. And uh, that is pretty much it, okay? Uh, the rest is my responsibility. I will teach you. I will build everything from the first principle. I will teach it in a manner so that even if you did not have the requisite background, you will still be able to follow the course. However, that does not mean that it will not be a graduate level course. It is still a graduate level course. Therefore, to bridge that gap from a very basic understanding, class 12 level understanding to someone who is going to do PhD in uh, 
a lab where molecular biology techniques will be used is not an easy journey. Therefore, my request to you would be that you approach, like, sorry, you study every day and you dedicate at least two to three hours a day on this course, research extensively over the internet so that the stories, the anecdotes, the examples I cite, you can read about them at depth. Okay. It is not exactly about learning everything there in the textbook. It is about <coughs> how the knowledge is applied. And for that, uh, you know, like you go to the net, watch some animations. I will try to refer you to certain anim animations whenever I can. Uh, you know, read some stories, read some uh, research articles, etc. So all those will be needed. Though it is an online format, um, but the rigor of your learning and my examining your learning process will not be compromised. Uh, it will mostly be based on assignments for which you will have to do a lot of research. And uh, you are actually encouraged to consult all sorts of resources to do your research. Because my purpose is to you know, make you do those research so that you can learn yourself. Okay, uh, with that forward, I will now start the lecture. Um, the textbook that we will be following for this course is uh, Molecular and Cell Biology by Lodish and others. Uh, in the older edition, seventh edition, this is chapter number five. In the newer edition, it's chapter number six. Before I get to the core of the topic, uh, let me tell you that what this, uh, what is it that we are going to do in this chapter? Overall, the objective of this chapter is to equip you with knowledge and understanding of doing a simple task. You know that most functional and behavioral traits that any organism has, whether it is a human or a bacteria, is because of the genes it expresses, right? Or because of the genetic repertoire it has. Now, you know, as you know that as humans, we have only 23,000 genes. Um, something much simpler, yeast, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae or uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombe, they have around 10,000 uh, genes. Now, we know the outcome of all these genes function collectively. You know, like uh, yeast grows, you know, um, uh, like uh, a variety of media, it uh, divides, uh, it, uh, increases in number. Mm, humans uh, talk, walk, think, write, you know, uh, eat all kinds of food, digest, uh, you know, all sorts of functionalities that we have. 
But do we know which gene is responsible for which part of our functionality? That is the question that will be central to this entire series of lectures. I have not calculated it. I think there will be at least 15 to 20 lectures on this topic alone. Okay. These are shorter lectures, uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes approximately. So, in other words, you can call it a genotype phenotype analysis. The genotype is what is there in the DNA, in the nucleus, and phenotype is the expression of it. Not gene expression per se, but the behavioral functional expression uh, in the organism. This analysis is very similar to if you walk inside a very large machine room, a control room like the one showed in this picture. Now, there are so many switches. It all regulates all kinds of functions, right? If you are in a power plant or something like that, there's so many kinds of functions. All are being controlled from this one control room. Imagine that all these functions are on. You entered the room. How would you figure out that which switch is working for which function? A rather simple way of doing that will be to turn off a switch and figure out which function is not working anymore. So you know that this switch is responsible for that particular function. The problem is that if you turn off the power switch, then all functions will stop. Then you will not be able to tell one function from the other. So in our genetic circuit also, there are such switches. There are switches that can be attributed to a very specific aspect. There are switches that are like sledgehammer that will turn off so many things that it becomes difficult to um, differentiate or you know pinpoint you know, which are the precise functions it was controlling. The other way of doing it in a switch room is that if you don't have any of the switches on, you go in, turn on one gene at a time, one switch at a time, and figure out which function is coming up. Unfortunately, that is not an option any geneticist or molecular biologist has, because you will be always experimenting in a living organism where all the gene functions are already on. The majority of the gene functions are already on. So within that setup, you have to do your genotype phenotype analysis. So you do not have the option of turning on one gene at a time. But those kind of analysis are also done. I will, without getting into the detail, I will tell you that in a multicellular complex organism like humans, the function in different parts of the body that are being executed are not identical. Like say, you know, your neurons, okay? They produce a insulating layer on top of the conducting, you know, neurons, electric wire. Now this insulating layer is only there in the neuron and not say in your muscle okay, or in your skin. So of course this is a very dramatic example. No, no experiments are done like that but conceptually you can think that therefore if I know all the genes that are functional in neuron and neuron alone 
and not in skin, then I can turn on those genes one at a time in skin and see which one is turning on insulation in skin, the production of the insulation in skin. Then you know. So while this particular example is too simplistic, it is not uh, practicable, but thematically similar experiments are done. So these two types of experiments, first turning off the switch, where you lose a function, it is called a loss of function experiment, or turning on the switch, where you gain a function, it's called a gain of function experiment. These are the two major types of experimental strategies that are employed to get to genotypic, to like to connect genotype and phenotype. And depending on which organism, how much you know about it, how many genes you know about it, uh, how complex the organism is, what is the genetic architecture, a lot of things. The strategy of how you do this will vary. Okay. Sorry, I'm having my tea. Um, so we will cover those in this uh, lecture series. Okay. First, some definitions. You know, you may find it funny that at a PhD level, I am trying to teach you what is a gene. But trust me, everything is in this particular definition. So as your textbook says, that it is the structural and functional unit of heredity. Okay? No disagreement there. Now, if you keep our objective in mind, is that I need to identify the gene. Okay? When I say identify the gene, I mean everything. I need to know the exact sequence of the DNA, where in the chromosome it is present, and everything about it. So therefore, and you will see that this is not always a contiguous element. It is uh, not, like the, a gene can be a collection of elements that are not contiguous. Okay? Therefore, we need to have an operational definition as well. So a gene must have a product. The product is an RNA. A protein is like uh, once the RNA is produced, then the protein is produced from the RNA. But now we know a whole lot of genes, we'll come to those later, which do not make any protein, they are only produced as like, the, the, for those genes, the final product is just an RNA. This is a change in definition, I would say, um, 20, little over 20 years or so, uh, till, you know, late 1990s, we used to think that a gene means something that produces a protein. Okay? But now we know that there are a whole lot of uh, non-protein coding genes uh, as well. Those make RNA. Therefore, a gene must have a product, whether it's an RNA or a product or, or a protein, but it must have a product. Now, the operational definition of the gene is that any stretch of DNA, in some cases it can be an RNA, let's not talk about that. Any stretch of DNA responsible for production of a particular gene product is referred to as the gene for the product. The emphasis on any is very important because you may think that it is, you know, you have learned few terms in your earlier courses like exon and intron, 
and I can guarantee most of you have learned it, perhaps not internalize the meaning of these terms, and I will not get into those right now. I will only say this much, that a gene is not that part only which is represented on the RNA, okay? The, no matter what the final product is, the first gene product is an RNA. A gene is not limited to that part. A gene is also limited, the, the gene will also include the stretch or stretches of DNA that will dictate whether or not that RNA should be produced, in what quantity, at what time, in which space. So all of this, which are called, referred to as the regulatory elements for a particular gene, they are also part of the gene, okay? So the gene is therefore any stretch of DNA responsible for production of a particular gene product, okay? That will include those parts of the DNA that are represented on the RNA product of the gene, and those parts of the DNA that are never transcribed, but are critical elements regulating the time, space, and amount of transcription. Okay, I hope that is now clear. Now I will tell you some other uh, definitions. These definitions are very important because uh, that's where you know your concepts will be very clear. Allele. Most of you have heard of allele. What is an allele? Allele is a, is a variant form of a gene. Okay. Now, how many alleles for a gene can be there? So, in any one of your cell, in any one of your cell, you have two copies of the same gene. Okay. One copy came from your mother, one copy came from your father. Chances are that these two copies are different from each other. So in your body alone, there are two different alleles of the gene. Now your friend will have the same gene and he or she would have inherited one copy from his or her mother and another copy from his or her father. Those two again can be different from each other and different from the ones that you have. So now between the two of you, there can be four alleles of the same gene. So if there are n number of people, there can be two to the power n number of alleles of the gene. So, literally speaking, the number of alleles is close to infinity. If you internalize the concept of mutation, then it will help you in understanding the concept of allele another time. So, what is a mutation? Many of you may have a notion that a mutation must be associated with something bad. Okay? Mutation. That's not the case. A mutation is a change from the standard. Now, it's a whole different debate. We will not get into it. That how do you define a standard? Which gene sequence you say, this is a standard sequence. Because end of the day, it came from someone, right? So I will not get to that uh, debate, but let's say there is a standard gene. Okay. There is a standard sequence of a gene. This is the defined sequence of a gene. Say that gene has uh, 5,000 nucleotides. Including the regulatory sequence and everything. If in another individual, 
the nucleotide at position 432 is different from the standard, then that's the mutant, that's the mutation. Now that mutation may or may not have any effect. Now, you know, there is a change. It does not change the gene expression in any manner, either in quantity or space or time or anything. So you will not know that there is a change unless you sequence it. But this is a mutation. It is not associated with something bad. There can be a mutation that will make the gene to be produced in more quantity than normal. Often, you know, more is good. So it's a mutation that is doing something good. Or of course, you know, a mutation can make the gene product ineffective, it can stop its production and so many other things. Those are also mutations. So a mutation is the change in sequence in any manner. What are the changes? I'll come to that. So now if you think of a 5,000 nucleotide long gene, then any of the nucleotide can be, can have, can undergo a change in one of three different ways, right? Like one is its normal sequence and you know, it can be replaced by, if, it is, if, if the normal sequence is an A, adenine, it can be a T or, or a G or a C. Again, the second base can have any of these changes. Again, the third base can have any of these changes. And so far we are only talking about one change at a time in a gene. If we think about two changes at a time, then the then if you consider the combinations, you can immediately realize that the number of variations that can possibly be in a gene is infinite. And therefore, two individuals having the same sequence of DNA, sorry, I, I, I meant it differently. Sorry, I, I'll restate. So I could convince you perhaps that the number of changes that can be there on a standard DNA sequence is infinite. And therefore, the number of alleles, the number of different version of the same gene will be infinite. So if you are in a class of 23 students and me, 24 people, there will be 24 times two, that is 48 different kinds of alleles. There is a possibility, there is a probability of having 48 different alleles of the same gene. It does not mean it is there, okay? But the probability is there that there will be 48 different variants of the same gene. If two people uh, uh, have the same allele, that's fine. It is not against the rule. But from your conceptual purpose, the number of alleles is always two multiplied by number of organisms, okay, in a particular set. So therefore, if when you were thinking about a gene, you should always like, you know, uh, there's a trick question we ask in uh, our interviews that how many alleles of a gene can there be? And most people will say two. That's not the case. Two is the alleles that you have. Okay. When you count other people in the room, the number of alleles go up. Okay. Now, the question is that, what are the different kinds of mutations that are there? As I first said that, you know, sometimes there will be a change in sequence from the standard, you will not even know about it. These are silent mutations. I'll just give you some examples. That, you know, the 
span between where transcription starts and translation starts, which is called the five prime UTR, five prime untranslated region, or three prime untranslated region, or in the intron, they are not represented in the protein, right? So if there is a change in sequence, often it will not affect the production of the gene product at all. There are cases where it will affect, but they, those are rare. So you will call these a silent mutation, right? There are, it is also possible that the change will be within the coding sequence. And still, it will not affect the production of the protein and or its function. Um, if you remember that um, the same amino acid may be coded by different codons, right? Which we refer to as codon degeneration, the codon degeneracy. Like uh, leucine alone is encoded by six different codons. So, if the mutation is such that a codon for a leucine is changed into another codon again for the leucine, chances are that uh, you will not know it at the level of protein production or its stability or its function. So those are also silent mutations. There are some strange cases where even such a mutation can have an effect on gene uh, production, but you know, in general speaking. Then there are missense mutation. Missense, but the sense is changed. Okay. So meaning the amino acid that was to be incorporated in the protein is changed. So no, uh, if the change is in the first or second nucleotide of a codon, it will change the amino acid. Sometimes even in the third base, it will change the amino acid. That is a missense mutation. It's a different issue altogether, whether that will be deleterious for the protein or not. There are missense mutations which are called conservative mutation, meaning the nature of the amino acid is not changed dramatically from valine to isoleucine, from aspartic acid to glutamic acid. The change in the amino acid, there is a, these are missense mutations, but it may not affect the function of the protein significantly. Yeah? These are therefore called conserved, conserved uh, mutation, conserved changes. So, when you are thinking about mutation, you should think about all these aspects. And then there is nonsense mutation. Nonsense, no sense, right? So the codon changes into a stop codon. There are only three stop codons. It will change into one of those. And therefore, the protein production will stop abruptly. That is certainly going to change the uh, function of the protein. Most certainly will change the function of the protein. It's a nonsense mutation. And then there is frame shift mutation. It is none of these, okay? You know that when the ribosome is scanning the RNA, it scans as units of three. Okay? Three nucleotide, one amino acid. Next three nucleotide, another amino acid. If one nucleotide is inserted in the gene sequence, in the coding region, this is strictly coding region mutation. If one nucleotide is inserted, then the next three will be different from the original three. Or if one nucleotide is taken out, okay, excised, then also the next three will be different from the original three. This is where I, um, you know, like I miss my board. I would request you to please write down a sequence 
and uh, draw you know the three letters as imaginary codons and then with a different color pen add a nucleotide in the middle in another line and see now how after the addition how the sets of three that you have marked earlier how that is completely changed okay. the same you can do with a removal of a letter from your top line the first line that you drew um, so we will uh, continue on this uh, today uh, like for this first lecture i will stop right here um, and uh, i'll come back uh, with, uh, like uh, with the next lecture soon okay thank you